Circles is Thursday evening, uh, every week at 6.30 to 8.30. Anything else I'm missing? And now... Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Scarlett. Now, it's, um, does anybody out there have any cares, concerns, or celebrations they'd like to share? Pam. Yay. That's been a long journey, hasn't it? Okay, anything else? Mary Ann. And you're all settled now, I bet. All unpacked and everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, well. I think we all can identify with that. <laughs> okay, anything else? Yes. Congratulations, Jenna. Okay, anything else to share? All right, now uh, Jim Rippey is going to share Daily Word with us today. Today is Sunday, December 6, 2015. Today's word is peace. Our affirmation is, the peace of God lives in me. I choose to begin this day in peace, as I do, I activate an energy that goes before me. In any encounter with someone who is stressed or upset, I respond with calmness rather than reacting. My peaceful presence emanates serenity wherever I go. The peace of God <coughs> that lives in me is readily accessible because nobody and nothing are bigger or more powerful than God. The calm peace of my soul remains undisturbed. If my imagination should create a worrisome scenario, I respond with a faithful remembrance that all things work together for good. I make the return to peace, I think clearly, I act confidently, and I maintain a calm and serene soul. Our scripture for today is Romans 8:28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Let us acknowledge this sacred moment by singing Surely the Presence. God is present here and now, and in that awareness, let us pray. <clears throat> As we settle into this quiet space that we are creating for ourselves right now, letting go of the stuff that we brought into this moment, just setting it aside, Feeling the lightning of our burden. We breathe. We accept. We
we breathe again. We accept what is right now. And for this opportunity to practice presence, we give thanks. And so it is that together we say, Amen. <coughs> Conflict of peace. Boy, another week. It's hard to look at these events that are going on in our lives and say, well, you know, that's the way it is. It's, uh, it's just the USA today. Um, it's, it's difficult to even say the words that cause so much angst this week. There is opportunity for us to look around our experience and see all the things that are wrong with the experience, all the things that, that are screwed up. Uh, some of us might use other verbs to refer to that. But the, the idea that we have to face once again the tribulation, the pain, the tragedy that has befallen the f those individuals, the families of those individuals, the, uh, the friends of those individuals that were massacred this week. We have to come to a position. I mean, that did happen. We know that happened. Um, and we have to come to a position of whether or not we're going to accept that or we're going to move our feet and respond in a way that is going to build a consciousness in our society that says, no, this is not permitted. This is not allowed. We're not going to allow our communities to be torn apart by this kind of action. Well, of course, the politicians jumped on, and they're the politicians uh, for gun control and the politicians for Second, Amend Second Amendment's rights, they jumped on. And we had even one presidential candidate declare that he was, he was declaring war on all Muslim radicals. Now, one could say, well, okay, uh, George, that's fine, but how do you define a Muslim radical? Is that one who uh, picks up a rifle and uh, murders people? Or is that one who uh, speaks loudly in an assembly? Uh, another presidential candidate. Uh, chose to uh, physically expel uh, a group of demonstrators who were uh, demonstrating against the, the positions that he was having. And so we have this concept that we're going to fight, we're going to repel, we're going to, um, we're going to bury the opposition. And it could be that that is the wrong way to do it. I mean, we've been attempting to do that for the last, how many years have we been on this planet, uh, this race of ours, uh, where it was stones and clubs at one point, now it's uh, assault rifles that expel three to five bullets a second. Um, so, where does it start? Of course it starts with us. It starts with each of us individually. We have a responsibility for our 
own reaction to the events of our lives. And it could be that the response that we have been so practiced in, we have to ask the question, how is that working for us? This year, we've had, I think it's 353 mass shootings. That is uh, where the perpetrator targeted four or more people. 353 in this year where we have, what, 320-some days that have passed so far? 330-some days? Well, there must be another way. And the other way is indeed something that we've been talking about often. We've been talking about it often. But what are we going to do about it? Patrick, could you uh, show that video, please? For. We light that candle for peace. We light this candle for peace. Well, there's two things I do know about peace. It's good when you have it, and it's bad when you don't. And peace has a price, and it don't come cheap. Whether it's peace within you as an individual, you're constantly struggling with that ego that keeps you from being at peace. And when you find that peace, of course you want to take it out into the world and share it with everybody you have, which is one of the beauties of peace. You want to share it. So the work at becoming universal peace is pretty hard. Sometimes it's selfless. Peace to the world. <laughs> the whole world? <laughs> <laughs> So our reaction to those little girls, are, oh, isn't that cute, right? They're displaying an innocence. Perhaps it's an innocence that we yearn for. But the elder in that video, I won't call him an old man because that would, that would, that would incriminate me. Um, the elder in that video spoke of the ego within us, and the ego within us is the cause of our lack of peace. This week, Alexandria, my granddaughter, was sitting on Linda's lap, Grandma, and Linda was regaling her with tales of, you know, how it was when she was her age and Troy's age, uh, you know, seven, eight, nine years old, living on the farm, and how she made... Uh, pets of the lambs that were uh, that were that were going to subsequently be harvested. Um, that uh, she would build these hay forts in the hayloft, right, by rearranging the bales in the hayloft. And uh, well, after each one of the stories, Linda let Alexandria tell her story, and her story would parallel, to a great extent, the story that Linda told, right? But it would be in the first person. It would be Alexandria having these experiences. Now, she would tell these stories. They would be a little bit different, different characters, different situations, but you could see the parallelism between the, the, the parallels between the stories. But at the end of the story, Linda would then ask her about her story. And Alexandria would fill in the details. And so, you know, Alexandria was constructing this experience that she supposedly had that was taken off of the experience that Linda had, that Linda had just related to her. And then 
after the details were filled in, then Linda challenged her about, well, did this really happen, right? Now, you've perhaps had that dialogue with, with a young child. And Alexandria was absolutely, yes, this happened. You know, she was absolutely certain that this happened. Now, we can look at that from a psychological perspective. We can say, well, actually what Alexandria was doing was she was integrating the story that Grandma was telling her, and it was becoming part of her experience, so she was learning from that. But the interesting thing that I found was that she was defending her story as being absolutely true. May have been a game for her, maybe not. Maybe she had integrated that story so much that now it became part of her experience, right? Nothing wrong with that because she's actually learning from the experience. But I thought that it was an interesting demonstration of what we all do. We have an experience. Something happens in our life. Some relationship unfolds in our life. And we bring it in, and then we fill in the details. Now, the details may or may not have happened out there, right? How many times have you had a conversation with someone, and you've integrated that conversation, you've filled in the details, and you've come to the conclusion that that is true when if you have a conversation with a second person who had been in touch with that person and had heard that story, it, was, it sounded like, oh, well, no, it didn't happen that way, right? That the other person saw it differently. They had the experience. They integrated it. They filled in the details. And lo and behold, the details didn't match. Well, in my mind, that's just a subtle difference from what Alexandria was doing. She was hearing the event of someone else's life, she is integrating it, filling in the details, and then def defending it as being absolutely true. And that is what brings us conflict in our lives. It's not necessarily that we have conflict with the person with whom we disagreed about the details of the events that we shared, but rather it is conflict in our own consciousness because we are put into a position, we put ourselves into a position where we defend that which we think occurred as being real. Well... This aspect of consciousness that insists upon separation from God and from each other that we call the ego, that the elder referred to there in the video, this aspect of consciousness which insists upon separation from God and from each other is the basis of that defense. Because now that we have integrated this story, whatever this story is, and we filled in the details, now we can say, yes, this happened, and this is true, and this is, I'm going to defend this truth against any and all comers, any and all attackers, anyone that, 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 that uh, uh, disagrees with me, I'll just set them straight. I'll convince them that they need to change their mind about this, whatever it is. Well, you may say, well, I don't do that. But I'd suggest that you look more carefully because I think that you'll discover, as I discover all the time, that I have integrated a story, filled in the details, declared it to be true, to only to find out that someone else has a different perspective on that. So am I wrong or is the other person wrong? Actually, neither one of us is wrong. We're just doing what we as humans do. We take events fill in the details, and declare them to be true, whether they are, in fact, what happened in actual fact. Well, this process of defending that which we think to be true is the source of our conflict. It is the conflict that disturbs our peace. There is a passage that I'll share with you from none other than the big guy himself, in Matthew 5, 
33 to 42. Yeah, okay. I didn't know whether I had, had the whole thing or not. Again, you have heard that it was said of those in ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, or by, uh, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this come from the evil one. Let's take that for just a moment. What is this idea of swearing, right? It is that I am declaring that what I hold to be true is true. That's what swearing an oath is, right? So what he's saying is, don't do that. Just look upon it and say yes, yes, or no, no. What is he suggesting there? He's saying, look upon the situation as it is unfolding and determine for yourself whether it is appropriate for you, yes, yes, or not appropriate for you, no, no. Okay? Now, this is not to say, look upon it and declare whether or not it's appropriate for someone else. That's called judgment. The former is discernment. So if we practice discernment, we can look upon the events of our lives and we could say, this is appropriate for me. This feeds me. This nurtures me. This allows me to come closer to the realization that God is present here in this moment. But if we declare that this is not the right thing for you, that this is not the right thing for you, and for you, no, sir, that's not the right thing for you, what we're doing is we're taking away, first of all, our peace. Do you see that? Because we are establishing a conflicted position with someone else that we then have to defend, whether we actually make the defense or not. But if I tell you that there is something that you need to do that's going to be appropriate for you, now I have established a position that I must defend if you are contrary to my opinion. Okay. So I've now established a battleground in my own consciousness. And that conflict is what robs me of my peace, regardless of the validity of what I have suggested is appropriate for you. Do you see that? As soon as I have judged, then I have established the battleground of conflict. Next paragraph, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. What is he talking about here? He's not talking about, I don't think, he's talking about someone who is being attacked by an AR-15 at three bullets per second. In that case, get the hell out of Dodge. Save your life. But what he's talking about here is he's talking about the day-to-day -day actions. He's talking about the day-to-day -day consciousness. He's talking about a behavior pattern. He's talking about a thought pattern. He's talking about the words that you use. In your relationships, first of all, begin with the thoughts that are appropriate for you. And do not impose those thoughts as appropriate for someone else. Feel free to express your thoughts in a way that is appropriate for you. Use words that express what you want to express. But do not impose your position on the other. Offer those words in a way that is, here's my opinion. This may or may not work for you, but here's how I see it. Okay? Do you see how that establishes a uh, uh, a space of peace that allows you to come to some consensual agreement about the circumstance, whatever that may be, and behave in a way that is appropriate for you. 
It doesn't have to be appropriate for others, but if it's appropriate for you, if it, if it allows you to establish peace within your own heart, if it allows you to be an expression of that which you truly are, the harbor of the Christ, if it allows you to be that, then for God's sake, and I mean that literally, for God's sake, be that expression. Because God, in that universal consciousness that we call God, that, that universal consciousness has the opportunity to move through you when you have established a domain of peace. That's what he's talking about. Yes, run like hell away from that guy that has that assault rifle. Defend yourself against the thrust of a knife. Yes, yes, yes. But in that defense... Do not kill, literally or figuratively. In the defense of your position, do not slaughter the one who is in opposition to your position. When you are in a relationship, realize that that person has a perspective that is appropriate for them, whether they know it or not, whether they're aware of it or not. And they may, in fact, engage their ego to defend the position that they have. It is not necessary that you resist their ego. Do not resist the evildoer. The evildoer is that aspect of consciousness which insists upon separation from each other and from God. Do not resist the evildoer. This is the solution to this indwelling space that is occupied either with conflict or with peace. This is the solution. Eckhart Tolle offered us this. In the power of now, he says, always say yes to the present moment. What could be more futile, more insane, than to create inner resistance to something that already is? What could be more insane than to, oppo to, than to oppose life itself, which is now and always now? Accept the moment as it is. Respond to the moment in a way that is appropriate for you. Do not respond with judgment, with conflict. Respond with peace. You can say no peacefully, can't you? You can say, no, that is not appropriate for me. No, I don't agree with your position. You can have that position if you like, that's fine. I do not need to accept that position. That is, a, that is an empowering way of discerning what is appropriate for you. And as we come into this season of Christmas, this Advent season, in this Christian tradition of preparing for the arrival of the Christ child, a thing that we must do is establish a domain of peace. Absolutely essential. The Christ child will not arrive in us if we are going to allow the ego to demand that we are separate from God. That will not welcome the arising of the Christ in us. Now this Advent season is a symbolic season, right? And we celebrate the arrival of the Christ child on Christmas Day. And in fact, we have a Christmas Eve service where we, you know, we have a candle lighting and we sing the praises of and we tell the story of the arrival of the Christ. But the arrival of the Christ occurs whenever you let it. The arrival of the Christ can occur on the 3rd of January, on the 6th of January, his celebration in the Orthodox tradition. I think that a celebration of the Orthodox tradition is the right way to go, by the way, uh, because you've, you've got all the after Christmas sales that you can take advantage <laughs> of. So the 
the arrival of the Christ can occur at any time you choose. But the domain of peace must be established first. We'll have our meditation. As we come into our meditation, let us come in with, I cast all my cares. Check to see if we have any, pe any tweets. New tweets? Yeah, okay. All right. We have a congregant in Pakistan that tuned in just now. So uh, she's, uh, hi, Saeed. Uh, she, <laughs> she has been uh, uh, tuning in from time to time and watching the archives for about four years now, I think. As we settle into this moment, let us recognize the power of our choice right now, in every now. The choice is in the thought we choose to think. That germinal thought, that initial drop in the cascade of our consciousness establishes the outcome unless adverse actions are taken. So let us choose right now to think peace. Realize that peace is our choice. There is nothing else that affects our choice of peace. We choose it. That thought of peace will lead to perhaps an immediate experience. That immediate experience might be the arising of this feeling of love. But the thought of peace establishes the train and that train will continue on the track we have established unless we choose to knock it off. That track of peace in our consciousness will stimulate, perhaps, words to express. And those words that we choose to express will establish the ground of our relationship with whom we are expressing. The domain of that relationship will unfold according to our commitment to hold the thought of peace. continues to be our choice and we can establish that relationship in peace
that relationship will unfold as acts, things that we do. Perhaps we open a door or we pull out a chair. Perhaps we smile. Perhaps we offer a warm greeting to a stranger that is an obviously in need of some peace themselves. Perhaps we engage in conversation. Someone who is obviously conflicted in pain. Perhaps we give them the gift, the gift of love and understanding in the moment, even if it's momentary, even if it's an interaction on the highway or in the grocery store line, or perhaps it's moving through the crowd that's rummaging for the right gift. Perhaps we are exuding pressing out the awareness of our own Christedness in this moment. Perhaps. Perhaps. And in the awareness of the power of our choice, we come back into this time and space, sharing the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, offering for unity now. As we take our offerings in our hands, let us bless them with this offering statement. Together, please. Divine love blesses and multiplies all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. I give in love because I trust in God. And once again, Trinity Damask, your reverence. This song was written by my friend Victoria Woodworth and uh, 